Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. Welcome to Cat Talk Radio. I'm your host, Molly DeVos, and today we're joined with a very special guest, two very special guests. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening to us on the podcast, hop over to YouTube and, and look at this handsome hunk. Yes. Today we so, have hey, Sherry. <laughs> Sherry Lynch. She's an award-winning broadcaster. You've probably heard her on the Bob and Sherry show. She's actually authored two best-selling books, one of which we're going to talk about today, and she holds a master's degree in social work. She's also a tap dancer. We might have to get her to show us that. She is a, admittedly a crazy cat lady and has four cats, so we get to talk about them too. And the book we're going to talk about today is Cooking with Cats. And if you love cats, which I'm assuming you do or you wouldn't be tuned in today, and you love to cook and you love to have fun, then you're going to love cooking with cats. So welcome to the show, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't realize that um, Larry Munson, my Bengal, my kitty best friend would be joining us too, but he is just a big galoot and a mama's boy. And it is ridiculous. He weighs 19 pounds. So when he climbs on you, you know it, right? <laughs> And he is so, he is such a mush. It drives me crazy when people say like, why would you want a cat? They're so aloof. Oh, please. Oh no. If, this one, if I would agree to it, this one would let me wear him in one of those baby slings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me on Cat Talk. Absolutely. Glad you're here today. So tell us about your other cats, your other three. So I have three Devon Rex cats, um, and I, two of them are litter mates, uh, Charles Xavier and Tiberius. And then I have an older Devon Rex who, um, Miss Esme Fudgy Wudge, my girl, I let my kids name all the cats. I don't know if it shows. Um, and Miss Esme came to us um, from a cattery in Ohio where we also rescued a retired breeding queen. And she was um, gorgeous. She lived with us for about three and a half years before she literally passed away of old age in her sleep in my arms on the couch. Oh, so, how nice is that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have, I mean, I've had cats my whole life. When I was a little girl, I was maybe six. I informed my parents that when I grew up, I was going to rescue all the cats nobody wanted. And I was going to live with them in a house called Pussy Haven. And Molly, it was probably <laughs> 20 years before I understood the laughter <laughs> that I got that day. But I just, I mean, I love animals. I have, you know, dogs. I've had a pet pig. We're going to get some chickens. I'm an animal person, but there's something about cats that's just next level for me. I can't even imagine a house without a cat. Yeah, I'm the same way too. People are like, well, why do you like cats and not others? I said, well, I like them all. I just, there is something about cats that's, I don't know. I just feel a connection and a kinship to, I always say it's probably because I'm very cat-like, you know? But, yeah, but not in a stereotype. No, not at all. Cause like my cat's not introverted. He's like, he's like Larry. He's like, I mean, we, we had housekeepers come and the cat goes, runs up and follows them around. All I mean, Pico's extremely social. He's not at all introverted, but yeah. I, I'd like said, I don't think I'm cat like in the stereotypical nature, but <laughs> you know, there's, there's this thing about there cats. Is a certain there is a certain kind of person that I think has an affinity um, for the cat. And I don't really know what quote unquote regular cats are like because every cat I've ever had has basically been a stuffed animal come to life. And I don't know if that's because of the way I, I handle them from when they're kittens or if I've just gotten super lucky. Like I, you know, I grew up in the middle of the wilderness, no radio, no television, no telephone, no, no playmates, except for my brothers. And they didn't want to play with me. They wanted to do boy things. They didn't want to play Barbies or <laughs> pretend to be teacher, you know, all the things I loved as a kid. And so, you know, my companions were always these cats that my mom would get me and I would dress them up and treat them like toys. And so they, act it like toys and the four cats that I have now uh, they're more like stuffed animals than they are like cats people come over to visit and then three months later they go get a Devon Rex kitten yeah because they think well, it must just be this breed and the Devons are a spectacular breed they're really charming but I think when you know when you love an animal and relate to an animal it's like anything else you 
the relationship is what you put into it. So I've never had one of these aloof, independent, yeah. unpleasant cats that cat haters talk about. I, I've only had one. And and I it was very, very long time ago. Adopted her from a shelter. And of course she was hiding under, you know, they put newspaper in the bottom of the cage and she'd mushed it up into a big mountain and was hiding. And I didn't really realize that this cat was probably totally unsocial outside cat. I, I adopted her because she was beautiful and I felt sorry for her, which I, I think happens yeah. a lot. And that cat, of course, never socialized to me or anybody, especially not anybody else, but she loved my other cats. And so she lived, you know, a relatively long, happy life hiding from me. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, of course, I, I learned a lot and uh, have never made those choices again. <laughs> Well, my oldest daughter, she's at college now and having grown up in a house full of cats and having always had basically a snuggle cat, she was really losing her mind. And it was time she just said, mom, I, I just have to have a cat. So she went to the shelter <clears throat> and she adopted a sweet boy who looks like Wilford Brimley. He's got a mustache, <laughs> four white socks. He had been, he'd been in the shelter for um, most of his little kitten life. And he was really sick. She didn't know that. Uh -huh. Now it wasn't, it wasn't one of the bad sicknesses. It was just, you know, a respiratory, like a kennel respiratory thing. So he was super docile. She gets him home. He's sneezing. I was like, honey, take him to the vet. She takes him to the vet. The vet puts him on some antibiotics, fixes him up. When the cat recovers, Molly, he's a madman. <laughs> he stalks her. He's, he's actively hunting her like she's prey. I'll be on the phone with her and she'll be like, hang on. Ah, stop biting me. He comes flying from around corners and bounces uh -oh. on her. So we don't, I don't know girl, if this is um like, uh, he's just going through his teenage years or if this, you know, is going to be a bad fit. But she is being terrorized by this little oh, beast. Oh, lots so of so sweet and so handsome. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta pray play with those guys. So get her a bunch of long wand toys. You know the, uh -huh. the long sticks with the toys. Get her a bunch of those so that she can redirect that energy to the toy and not her leg. And then treat oh, toss. You know they like if they a hard treat that they might like toss it so that it becomes a not a fretch because they're not bringing it back, but, you know, toss it. So they run away something and go get it. Yeah. It's something to hunt and it, it burns off some energy, right? So they're getting some exercise because it is hard on them. You know, in the wild, they spend like six hours a day hunting. So when we keep a cat indoors in a house, it's, it's hard on them. You know, they need, they need stuff to do. I so. will tell her that because we have, um, She's got CBD. She's got catnip. She's Amazon.com shows up every day with a new cat enrichment <laughs> product for her. And she, uh, she's like a hostage in her own I'll, house. I'll send you a, a couple links to some podcasts that'll help her. Oh, yeah. that'd be awesome. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Now tell us about this book. Of course, when, you know, the title is hysterical, like it reminds me of the book, 101 Uses for a Dead Cat right there yeah. you go <laughs> yeah that's perfect <laughs> yeah like cooking with cats like are are you are they helping or are you like recipes cat stew recipes or <laughs> what's going on here sherry <laughs> well as everyone who has a cat or multiple cats knows it doesn't matter um how clean your house is how spotless your cats are, blah, blah, blah. There's always going to be that one person at work or in the neighborhood or church or whatever who says, I know you're a good cook, but I'm not eating anything from your house because you have cats walking all over the place. I can't even tell you how many times I've heard that. And I, oh, speaking of, <laughs> and there's Larry. Hey, Larry, yeah. you have something to say. <laughs> oh, he's so ridiculous. I'm sorry, y'all. So I have to put him in the lap. So, um, so I, you know, I would tell people, yes, I have cats and dogs, but I promise you they're not in the food. Like you don't have to, <laughs> people be like, mm -mm, girl, like my daughter's dance teacher, girl, I wouldn't eat that with, I wouldn't eat that with anybody else's mouth. And so, you know, I just <laughs> laughed about it. And then the pandemic hit and um, my business partner, Tony Garcia and I were talking one day, this was right in the beginning of lockdown. And, and he said, 
maybe you could use your time in quarantine to write another book. And I was like, maybe you should punch your own face. Like I am so (laughs) busy and overwhelmed and I've got children that are doing school from home. And, and, and besides, if I was going to write another book, I would write a cookbook for crazy cat people called cooking with cats for all the people that are tired of being criticized for having cats in their kitchen. And I, I was joking. (laughs) <laughs> and he called me a couple of days later and said, we have a publishing deal for cooking with cats. Oh my gosh. I was like, you you got to be kidding. So here's what I did. I spent the uh, first mm, six, seven months of the COVID lockdown writing this cookbook. And I reached out to our um, radio and podcast audience and said, I'm working on a project about cats and the kitchen. And would you like your cat to be featured in the book? And so people from all over the U.S. sent me pictures of their cats. Like, here's Taco Cat. Oh, how funny. (laughs) Um, I have pictures of cats in saucepans. Oh, here's a fun one. Oh, how funny. Is that Larry? No, that's not Larry. That is, um, that's a cat that belongs to Christopher Robinson. This is my cat on the cover. This is one of my Devons, Tiberius, on the cover. (laughs) But the book is filled with real recipes um, for people. And at the end, there's a couple of tasty little special homemade treat recipes you can make for your cat. But it's a real cookbook with really delicious recipes for people. And every photo is of a cat going wild in someone's kitchen. Real cats, real kitchens all around the country. And and then we released it as sort of like a kind of a fun, feel good kind of community project, you know? And it took off and I was I was amazed. It was a really fun thing to do. It was a lot harder than I ever imagined. Until you've written a cookbook, you you don't understand what's involved in writing a cookbook. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it was a blast. And I love all the photos, the cats from everywhere in this book. It's amazing. That's great. Now, are all these your own recipes? Yeah. So I, you know, I come from um, a a family of Italian American, we're an immigrant family. Like my grandparents literally were the first generation born in the U.S. And so I grew up with people who cooked, but never with a recipe. They cooked by feel handful of this, pinch of that, taste it, adjust it, needs a little bit of this, a little more of that. And so, you know, when you learn to cook like that, it's great. But when people ask you for a recipe, happens to me all the time. I know what you mean. Yeah. You you're like, I don't really have a recipe. So when I sat down to write this book, I thought I'm going to put in here all of the things that like listeners have asked me to share recipes for, but then I had to actually create a recipe and I'm you know, like I'm a media person and a social worker. I am not a trained chef or cook. So I had no idea how to do that. So I literally had a notebook and a pencil and I would make the same thing 20 times. Oh, wow. Writing down every step and then scribbling it out. No, no, it's actually, it's actually two teaspoons full of cinnamon. Scribble it out. The notebook looks like, like if anyone stumbled across it, they would be like, there's a psychotic serial killer in somebody's (laughs) kitchen. Like it was crazy. But eventually, you know, I got there and I shared Italian grandmothers do not like to give you their secret recipes, but I was able to pry the recipe for real, real, like South Philly Italian immigrant family, Gubba Sunday meatballs and gravy. I was able to get that out of my mom and then translate it into an actual recipe that you can follow. And so, yeah, they're, there are all sorts of things in there that I cook all the time and that I grew up cooking. And I reached out to some really epic cat people that I know around the country. I mean, people who are cat people. And we know there's a difference between I yes. a cat and I am a cat person. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew that I knew a handful of really serious capital C cat people who were great cooks. And I said, I'm doing this project. Do you want in? And so uh, there are recipes from other great, um, cat loving cooks and it's just super fun but I promise you I promise you everything in there is absolutely delicious and the recipes are super detailed and every recipe comes with a little story and then photos of cats in frying pans how fun and what a perfect time of year like this is going to make the best Christmas gift 
<laughs> oh, if you're a cat person and you love to cook, yeah. I mean, if you like to cook and eat and you're you're good with cats, you're gonna love this because I pro I promise you, um, there's nothing in here that isn't really delicious that that you can't make. And because I grew up um, working with home cooks, when I when I created these recipes, I took for I didn't take for granted that that um, people knew all the technical cooking terms that you see sometimes in like a hardcore cookbook. Yeah. You know, like a lot of people, what the hell does braise mean? What, right. What does that mean really? Like if you haven't grown up with that. So, so I was really detailed about it, you know, and, and kind of walked you through it the way I learned to cook as a child. And so it's super fun. And we take a portion of the proceeds about every six months or so we, um, we run the numbers and then we donate, um, a big portion of the proceeds to rescue organizations oh, nice. that help because, you know, I'm anti kill shelter, obviously like any sure. sane animal person would be. Um, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of animals out there that don't have homes and yeah, we should, know, we, we should, should really, job of spay neuter, right? yeah, we should really be anti surrender your pet to a shelter because the shelters are, are, are not the, are not the bad guys here. You know, they, they, they end up with out of capacity, you know, what are we going to do? We're going to stack these dogs up in crates in the parking lot. And, you know, you, you just, it's, it's not yeah. the shelters, sadly, it's people who give up on pets that they have made a commitment to, you know, it's that's, always the people and not, and yeah. not spaying and neutering. Um, you know, we rescued, we just lost our very elderly rescue dog. He just went over the rainbow bridge of, of old age. It, it doesn't matter. It's heartbreaking. However, it, it happens. But when we rescued him, you know, we got him at a shelter and we, he was in his little cement floor, you know, chain link house. And, um, and he had been very badly, very badly abused before we got him home. And I, it still breaks my heart when I think about it. There's so many animals out there that through no, I mean, they just don't deserve the misery that they live in. And as people, we do need to do a better job. We need to do a better job of understanding what we're getting into when we, when we bring a pet home and understanding that these animals are going to have needs that are sometimes going to be difficult and expensive. And, you know, yeah. we must stay neuter. We must keep them current on their vaccinations, whether that's rabies, distemper, parvo, whatever, heartworm. It's, it's always people, Molly, the, the education yeah. problem and the, the, cruelty problem is always on the people side of the fence. Yeah. Um, and funding. I mean, if, you know, funding. most shelters are the, the shelters that are euthanizing animals are primarily municipal shelters where people can, you know, freely come in any day and any time and dump their animal like, okay, it's the shelter's problem. And they're funded by your city tax dollars or your county tax yeah. dollars. And so the reason that these animals are sitting on concrete floors and chain link fences is because there's not a lot of funding. You know, your city tax dollars have to fund everything that happens in your city. So, you know, if you care about that too, get involved on your city level. And there's usually animal commissions you can be involved on in city and, and help your, your city manager and your mayor know that you want your city shelter to be priority in, in receiving funds out of the budget. Cause that's what they need. They absolutely need. And there are lots of cool ways to get involved. So for example, one of the um, cats in this book, and we see if I can flip to his picture, Lambo. One of the cats in this book, his, his cat person um, is a professional photographer and videographer who volunteers at the local municipal animal shelter. And every couple of weeks she goes out there and she brings props, lights, like a full photography rig. I'm talking little miniature Victorian feigning couches <laughs> and she puts the cats in all of these settings and photographs them. And then the photos go out wide on social media to encourage adoption for these animals. And that is just one great example of here he is. Here's, this is one of her photos. Let's Lambo see. and his chef pet. Oh, look at that. How cute. That's perfect. And so every, every 10 days or so, my social media will blow up with these hilarious photos of, you know, cats 
on fainting couches and in carriages. And that's her work. And then those cats find homes. So there are ways to be involved and support rescue and adoption um, that, that go beyond anything you may think of. And she kind of created that because she, she wanted to take her skills and and all of her props and everything and do something fun with it. There are lots of ways to help. There, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of ways to get involved in your local shelter. And if you're not comfortable, because it, it can be a hard place to, to go and actually work. And But like I said, if you're not comfortable, there are ways to get involved where you don't have to be hands-on and on site. There's lots of administrative things they could use help with, stuffing adoption packets, like I said, sitting on animal commissions. There, there's a bunch of ways. So absolutely, that's that's hugely important for us to help take care of those critters. Now, something else in your bio that, um, and I should bring Dewey in here. My husband, Dewey, usually co-hosts Cat Talk Radio with me. And in your bio, it says you're an enthusiastic fan of aliens and Bigfoot. And I'm telling you what, if my husband, if you leave him alone for, you know, 30 seconds without anything to do, he'll be on his phone watching something and I'll go over and it'll be like finding Bigfoot or, you know, alien files and all this. And he is constantly watching alien and Bigfoot shows. <laughs> Are you like that too? Oh my God. Since I was tiny. I mean, I am obsessed. There's no other word. It's not just aliens. It's not just Bigfoot. I'm, I'm obsessed with anything that's a little bit off kilter, but that includes things in the natural world. Like and I, and I have serial obsessions. Like I'll, I'll spend months where I'm obsessed with baleen whales or months where I'm obsessed with the way an, like a, an insect's eyeball is constructed. <laughs> I go back and forth from yetis to aliens to what's at the very, very deepest part of the ocean where those geothermal vents release like incredibly hot poisonous gas and yet we have life like mm -hmm. i am just obsessed with things that are weird and things that are true and real in the world <laughs> so your husband, think, and, I, your husband oh, yeah. and i would have a lot to talk about oh yeah and then, so you clearly think bigfoot is real also you know here's what i think i think that it is possible um that we have some species of animal is it a hominid I, I don't know is it related to the great apes i don't know i think it is pos possible that there is a species that we have not yet discovered and i know that seems crazy given how we've blanketed the world with technology and people and um, asphalt and lights but i can i can tell you that where i grew up in northwestern wyoming um most of the environment around us was not only unknown, but basically unknowable. It was unreachable. It was unreachable. And there are places on this planet still, and the deep ocean is a great example. We know more about space right now than we know about the deepest part of Earth's oceans. There are places in the world that human beings have not yet been able to traverse and penetrate. So, do I think that Bigfoot is real? I think it is possible. It is possible that there is a species of animal out there that could account for some of these sightings that we have not yet been able to name and classify. Yeah. We were out hiking in the mountains of northern New Mexico in the in the winter, and there was still snow on the ground. And uh, and we saw what my husband is convinced to this day were Bigfoot tracks, two, two of them, uh, an adult and a juvenile. And we took pictures and of course he sized it. And so anybody brings a Bigfoot, first thing he does is he's like, let me show you my Bigfoot prints. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's kind of cool. When you have an, like growing up in a very isolated part of the world where there's no light pollution, and no real air traffic to speak of, you know? Um, and you see things, even the adults, like even my mom will tell you that she's experienced things and seen things that she can't explain. I had in my twenties, a horrifically frightening missing time episode that I have, I can't even, I can't account for it. I can't even really talk about it because my, my whole body 
like seizes on me. It's such a panic thing. And, and so like your husband, when you've experienced something or witnessed or seen something, it changes, it changes what you believe and what you're willing to believe. But also, you know, for me in a, in a bigger picture way, I want the world to be filled with mysteries. I don't want everything to be known. To me, the idea of there being nothing in the vast universe except for us is terrifying. That's an existential abyss I don't even want to consider. The idea that we, like as humans, we're so petty and aggressive and simple-minded, the idea that we know everything there is to know about this planet is depressing. Yeah, like, I'm isn't it? History, yeah, you know? yeah, I totally agree. I I do. So I I should have I should have had him join us today. We could have been a Bigfoot show. <laughs> Mystery. Girl, we wouldn't have got I a single saw... mention of a cat in. That's I for know, sure. right? <laughs> but it, you know, even to bring it back to cats, like I think it is incredibly magical to share your home with little animals who you know and love and cherish and protect, but who are as unknowable to you as the planet Neptune. Yeah, and cats are. And I think that's one of the intrigues with cats is that to people, they are very mysterious. Why did he do that? You know, what is he doing? And, and you know, so when I, when I went to school to get my feline behavior certification, I, I didn't realize, but greatly appreciated the fact that they were going to start with, you know, what does a cat see? What does it smell? What does it hear? What does it feel? How did it evolve? You know, what does it need to eat? And how does its organs work and some anatomy and things like that? Because when you start to put all those pieces together, you realize that we really do a pretty poor job of taking care of these wild creatures because cats really are, yeah. you know, dogs are domesticated. I always say cats are semi-socialized, you know, <laughs> they're, they're not really technically domesticated and they still have a 96% DNA link to their wildcat ancestors. So, you know, they are little wild tigers you know, that, that live with us and, and understanding them as a species, I think helps us to kind of figure out some of those mysteries too. And then again, sometimes they just, they, you know, there is no question that they see and feel things that we don't, you know, I see Tabasco. I mean, Pico, my past cat was Tabasco. I see Pico all the time. We'll be somewhere like we were at my mom's just this past weekend. And Pico gets up out of a dead sleep, ears, radar ears come forward, looks to the hall. Now I wasn't there. This is Dewey's, Dewey's account. He said, everybody was gone. My mom and her husband and I were off to a doctor's appointment for them. So he says, Pico is asleep in that chair, wakes up, ears forward, eyes real big, jumps down, is kind of, you know, creeping really slow, tail down, looking cautiously out in the hall. And he said, and then he went out in the hall and his tail bushed up and he kind of Whoa. backed up a little bit. And Dewey said he went out there and there was, there was nothing there, nothing that we could see or hear. <laughs> well, that, that's one of the great, um, uh, hilarious aspects of human beings to me is, you know, we think we, our senses are very limited really when you get to it, our, our visual, like the, 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 the the wavelength of light that we can perceive, like our visual senses are incredibly primitive, our hearing incredibly primitive. We are, we are so limited. And yet in our vast arrogance, we assume right. that anything there is to be perceived in reality, we are surely perceiving. Yeah. And so we, true. we don't stop to consider this was like, I went through a long period of obsession with the way insect eyes are constructed. We don't stop to consider that the reality that we've constructed for ourselves is based on these very limited sensory inputs that we have. And of course, animals, everything is more acute. And for a cat, because they're meant to hunt their predators, everything, all of their senses are more acutely attuned than ours. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question for you. So my okay. Bengal who, Bengals are... Um, Bengals are magical cats. They're, they're technically half wild, half domesticated, right? I don't know what Larry uh, Munson, my Bengals uh, genome looks like, but we didn't get much wild there. He is a big throw pillow. 
but he has this one really adorable habit. Molly, he has a couple of little stuffed toys and they're his babies and he, he carries them around in his mouth from place to place to place. And sometimes he'll scream at them, put them in his mouth and scream while they're in his mouth, which is kind of funny, <laughs> but he takes them one by one. He brings them to bed at night. And so I wake up in the morning with my cat and three or four or five little stuffed toys. Oh, how cute. He's, he's a male. So, you know, it's like, what's going on? What is going on with Larry Munson and his babies? Well, they, <laughs> who knows, right? He's a cat. <laughs> who knows? First of all, um, a company called Base Paws will let you do a DNA test on them. And it's a simple little cheek swab and it's pretty in inexpensive. And you should do that on him to, to because it's kind of cool. And it also gives you a dental, uh, like a dental score tells you how they base it on the bacteria that they get. So they oh, can wow. tell you, you know, like if it's, you know, if he's got dental disease coming on or something like that. So I would suggest doing that because it's always fascinating and, and fun. But, you know, a lot of times our cats will do things because we initially paid attention to it, right? They are masters of cause and effect. You know, dogs have a social hierarchy and they see us as, as pack leaders and pack members. So they will do things to please us, but the cat doesn't have a social hierarchy. So it won't really do anything to please us, but it will do something to get attention or to get a treat or to get fed. They're, they're very, very self-absorbed when it comes to what they want and what they need. And so if at one time when he started doing this, you were like, oh, Larry, look how cute is that your baby? And you pet him or yep. you even just talk to him, then he's probably gonna do it just because, oh, it got me attention. And he's clearly an attention hound, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so they do, you know, it, it, if you think about what happens when they do it or when they first started doing it, we very often are, are the source of why they're doing what they're doing because anything we pay attention to, they will do more. So I always tell people when you have a problem behavior, ignore it. Now it's really difficult when it's like your daughter's cat who's latched <laughs> onto your leg with its claws and teeth, right? It's like, how do I ignore that? <laughs> but that you have to redirect into something. So I say, if you don't want a cat to do something, you have to show it what you want it to do instead. Because they don't have that social hierarchy and because they think they are the dominions of everything and we are not anywhere remotely like a pack leader, they're not going to do something just because we are unhappy with it. You know, they won't stop doing it. A dog will. If a dog sees that it's made you unhappy, it, will, it won't do it again. But that doesn't work psychologically on a cat. So with a cat, you have to go don't do that, do this instead. And you have to give it a, a, you know, a reasonable alternative to the behavior. So you got to kind of sleuth yeah. out why it's doing it and then coming up with an alternative for that behavior for it. That is so helpful and so interesting to, because I'm thinking about all of the like quirky, goofy little things that our four cats do. Four cats, four completely different personalities for anybody out there that thinks all cats are the same. No. Um, and you're right. Some of the really hysterical things they do are because I'm like, who's mommy's little munchkin? You know, they, they just write that right out. <laughs> right. I can't wait to tell my daughter some of this because she is, you know, she's literally like the cat sleeps in her bed and she's in the closet. Like it's crazy how terrible oh, her no. she is. <laughs> yeah, no, kid. no, we got to get that fixed for her. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And we're on, we're coming up on our 200th podcast of cat talk radio so if she just goes out to cattalkradio.com and then there's under the podcast tab there's categories and and there will categories of course and I love it. <laughs> there'll be a section on you know aggression and anxiety and that kind of thing and there's lots of them there that cool. that will help her with that but but basically you've got to redirect that you've got to say no no cool. not my leg this instead and you got to look at why that cat's got so much pent-up energy and and a lot of it is age you know up until they get kind of past that two three-year-old mark sometimes it takes till four 
you know, then, then, then they become a little more of a catch potato, but they can be wild children up until then. You know, it's funny because listening to you talking about the difference between cats and dogs and, um, I realized that my husband is very cat-like. <laughs> <laughs> He's very cause and effect oriented. Um, I guess early in our dating relationship, I must have found some of his behaviors adorable because he definitely keeps bringing them back. So yeah, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I have gotten quite a bit out of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, this is might have been the uh, the first podcast where we've talked about cats, cooking, recipes, Bigfoot, aliens, <laughs> right? <laughs> all of my all of my favorite that's and great. all of the oh, best. And here's my Bigfoot man now. Dewey, do you have a second? We're Dewey, live on here. we're live on Cat Talk Radio. Now I want you to meet Sherry Lynch of the of the Sherry show, we talked about that, right? Come down yeah. here. Now look at here on her bio. She's an enthusiastic fan of aliens and Bigfoot. Now we've Yay. been talking, right? we've been talking about That's Bigfoot on Cat Talk Radio. You missed it today. Molly told me you came upon tracks. Hold on, I mean, I that you. is like I got you on my headset. I don't think he can hear you. Hang on. Let me. There we go. Can we hear you now? Can you hear me doing nope. Molly told Hang me? Hang on, you I unplugged the wrong thing. Okay. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Now can, can you do it? Can you hear us? Now I still can't hear you. All right. I'm going to just put these on Dewey. Talk, uh, talk Bigfoot for a minute. Okay. Oh my goodness. What have I done here? I really messed things up y'all. <laughs> Okay, here's what we're going to do. Can you still hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I've completely undone that, and now I need speakers. We can't hear you. <laughs> uh, all right, I have totally messed this up today. <laughs> all right, so since I can't hear you, let me try this. You guys just go can ahead. You, can you all right, Dewey, thanks. Can I can't hear, hear you any longer. My my. Headsets out, my microphone's out. So y'all, for every time, for everyone that's listening, this is the government. They don't want us talking about the fact that Bigfoot is real. I can't so I can't hear a thing she's saying. So <laughs> I can hear a thing. I'm sorry. So tell everybody where to buy the book. That's that's the next thing. Okay, you can find cooking with cats, which does make a really fun holiday gift for your favorite cook and cat person. You can find it at amazon.com, but amazon.com marks it up and we have it at a much better price um, direct on our website, which is B-O-B-A-N-D-S-H-E-R-I.com. Just click on the store tab and you can get it um, for a few bucks less at bobandsherry.com. Or you can jump online and get it at Amazon. And again, you know, we take a portion of the proceeds uh, twice a year and pull them off and send them to various cat organizations, shelters and rescues. I'm doing a big um, event this coming weekend for Catterday where we're raising money along with um, the Mac Tabby Cat Cafe and the Dr. Pussum's Cat Company. We're raising money and awareness for um, shelters and also a rescue and adoption. So once again, Cooking with Cats is available on amazon.com and at B-O-B-A-N-D-S-H-E-R-I.com. And Molly, thank you so much for having me on Cat Talk. This has been so much fun. Oh, thank you for being here. And I finally got the sound on. Of course, once Dewey walked out, right, I was able to hear. I, listen, tell Dewey, that was the government. They don't want the truth about Bigfoot out. Isn't it interesting that the minute we were going to talk about finding Bigfoot tracks, girl? I know. My, mm -hmm. my, my stuff shuts down. Yeah. Uh-huh. Coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. We really appreciate you. And everybody go out and buy the book. That's what I'm doing. As soon as I get off the show, I'm going out to Amazon and getting me a, a copy of Cooking with Cats because I'm always looking for great recipes. So that'll be wonderful. Thanks for all Thanks. you do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. We'll catch up with you when you write your next book. Thank you. It'll have to be about cats, of course. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Prepping with cats. Right. <laughs> Bigfoot hunting with cats. Right? Exactly. Exactly. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. Until next time, keep calm and purr on.